Okay, let's begin with you, Maria, um, if you can. Um, you wrote this article in which, which your basic thesis seems to be, um, you know, you based it on the study uh, on, the, on the Quranic verses that address Jews and Christians. And you, um, as your title says, you offer or refer to as rules of engagement that Muslims need to interact with Jews and Christians. Um, and you also emphasize that it should be done with virtue and good manners, adab. Um, I'm curious, the question, the, the idea in your, your title, Rules of Engagement, seems to imply, at least, that we're missing some rules of engagement, that we're, we, or we don't have enough of them, or you don't, we don't have the adequate uh, or appropriate rules of engagement, especially Muslims. Are you, um, could you explain whether you think there are, we're missing something in our interfaith engagement? And if so, what is that? Well, first of all, um, let me say, Thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I, I do have to say that I don't think Rules of Engagement was the title I actually gave to the article. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was a phrase that you used in the article. Thank you. It yeah, is a you're phrase right. that I used in the article. Uh, no, it's not that I don't think that, I, it's not that I think that there are rules that, or of engagement that are missing, quite the opposite. I think that there's quite a good amount, uh, both in the Quran, in the example of the Prophet Muhammad himself, uh, certainly in other texts, about the importance of adab um, in inter, inter well, in interreligious dialogue, but also simply in engaging other people. And I think that interreligious debate is often focused on trying to win a particular argument. Uh, whether it's uh, debates within the Muslim community about how they should view Judaism and Christianity. Is it, uh, does Islam supersede them? Are they somehow still valid or religions that can provide guidance? Um, or whether it's debates between people of different religions about which of their religions makes the most sense, is, is the most grounded in logic or reasonable propositions. And I think that the purpose of encountering the other is not simply a matter of trying to win a debate or win an argument. I think that the rules of adab are important in that they help us to engage the other person as a human being. Uh, Sheikh Hamza talked about this importance of, of humanity, the rights that you have as a human being. And I think that when that sometimes in debates, and especially in contemporary society, where debates take place on Twitter, <laughs> they take place on social media, we never we, we we lose the encounter, the importance of the encounter with another human being. And in my own experience in interreligious dialogue, there is nothing like sitting across from a person who f follows a faith that's different from your own, and yet you can see. You can feel in, in talking to that person and seeing them that they are sincerely striving for truth. And yet they come to a different conclusion that you do. And I think that Edeb helps us remember that. It helps us remember that the other person is a human being and has to be treated with a certain degree of respect. And it also helps us to remember our own humility as human beings. We don't know everything. We have to wait until God informs us at the end about our differences, which is a way of saying that no religious scripture in and of itself puts all of these differences to rest. In fact, the Quran often says people differ after the book came to them. And thank, thank you for explaining that. I mean, that's what you mean by virtue and, and other. Were you? Well, I think virtue and adab are different. And how, how does that factor related? into the engagement? Um, I think that the, you know, the Quran, as I said in my article, tells us that we have to deal with other people, right? that which is the best, the most beautiful, the most virtuous. But all human beings have this potential for virtue. Virtue is universally recognizable, it's universally attainable, it's universally valued. But human beings are born only with a potential for virtue. Virtue has to be cultivated. And what adab does, I think, is it forces people to behave 
almost as if they've acquired that virtue. Um, it, it allows them to, it constrains their worst impulses and forces them to have the best possible opinion of the person that they're talking to. Um, Andrew, I want to, um, you are a you know, political philosopher and you understand the Western tradition quite well and you're also a scholar of Islam. Um, you chose to write on a topic about, you refer to as a radical other, which is the disbeliever and how it, that person is viewed from an Islamic standpoint. Do you, did you choose that topic partly because you think there's a tension between the Western liberal tradition or liberal societies, if you will, and the Islamic tradition, and that somehow there's a failure among those committed to the Western tradition and Muslims who live in the West to fully understand each other? Is that part of what you are trying to get at in your article? Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation to be here, and thank you for everybody for turning out and, and filling the hall. Uh, I think it's actually, I'm glad you asked that because I think there can be a certain kind of misconception, which is to say that um, there's a special burden on Muslims to accept the radical other or the disbeliever, or that Muslims are particularly distinct in um, having this as a stumbling block. And to be honest with you, the question is actually motivated from the other side. So if Maria is talking about the ethics of encountering difference from the standpoint of personal ethics. So I, as a seeker of truth, as an arguer about the truth, I encounter somebody that disagrees, I encounter that somebody, somebody that disagrees in a very, very radical way. Uh, what kinds of ethical dispositions should you cultivate if you care about certain kinds of things? If you care about truth, if you care about your own peace and well-being and harmony of your soul, if you're always arguing with everybody on Twitter, you have a very miserable life, even if you don't exactly recognize it, uh, and what harm you may be doing to the other, right? So now, so that, those are all very, very important uh, concepts as pertain to individual ethics. Now let's say that we magnify it to the level of society. Uh, every time you think about the composition of society, a society that is complex, that is composed of many, many different kinds of people, I think that we're forced to ask ourselves a certain set of questions. First, what kinds of differences between us are acceptable and not acceptable? Another question is what kinds of differences between us uh, do we expect to always endure and what kinds of differences can we hope to be eradicated? And, uh, and when you put those two questions together, you have a kind of political ethics of trying to understand what is the appropriate scope for political action. So let's just begin with what I hope is in this audience a fairly uh, uncontroversial point, which is to say that our country um, is built primarily on a history of racial difference, uh, in which there's a certain kind of imaginary that the country primarily belongs to white settlers. And this is at the detriment of people who involuntarily were migrated from Africa, or people who were found here and were the involuntary hosts of people that migrated from Europe. Now, how you deal with this history is extremely complicated, but I, but I think we could all agree, at least in this audience, that the, the ideas that dominated this country for a very, very long time, which is that white people are inherently superior that the country naturally belongs to white people, uh, that white people are inherently more virtuous, more intelligent, more hardworking, that these are ideas that have a legacy and that we have to live with. Now, we may say they're markers of sin, we may say they're markers of history, we may say they're markers of false consciousness, but I think it's the absolute ethical responsibility of everybody who lives in America to say that, 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 that it is our responsibility to expect and to hope that these kinds of ideas will be eradicated, that these are not objects of toleration, these are not objects of sort of bemused indifference, right? Oh, well, my crazy old racist uncle. No, these are objects of eradication. Now, so that's, let's take that as a fixed point. Well, let's ask what other kinds of things we think ought to be eradicated and what kinds of things we think ought to be sort of born with toleration and what kinds of things we think ought to be recognized as reasonable differences. So I could go through the list, but I'll just jump to the end of your question. From a liberal perspective, there is a category of things that people differ on that are sometimes called your conception of the good. 
Now, to a religious consciousness, this sounds a little bloodless, right? So my belief in Islam or my belief in Christianity is not my conception of the good. It's my ontological understanding of what I am, where I am going, and what is the source of my dignity. But for all that, what liberal political philosophy is based on is the idea that there are many such ontologies. Now, what do you say about this? One possibility is that one of them is right. Another possible, but then we have all of Maria's problems, which is, well, we, that may be true, but lo and behold, we're always disagreeing about it. Another possibility is that a few of them might be right, perhaps the Abrahamic religions, right? So there's just the, right, there's the, the, there's the series of revelations from God, and those are what's acceptable. Well, another possibility is that all of these questions about metaphysics, about the origins of the cosmos, about the purpose of human nature, what is the source of virtue, what makes for a good life, all of those are of the same ilk. Some are religious, some are secular, but it's the same kind of human activity that ends up in disagreeing about them. And so if you take it at a macro level, I think what's motivating this is that from a liberal perspective, religion is a problem. And so by grounds of reciprocity, the question is, well, from a religious perspective, what is the, what is the attitude towards a conscientious rejection of anything other than a materialist explanation of the self, the body, and, and, and human striving. So it's more, I think, a question of my motivation is, well, in liberal political philosophy, how we tolerate religion is an active question. And so why not see what happens when we try to pose that question also from a religious perspective? So your assumption, thanks for the explanation, but your assumption is that in maintain political order in liberal societies, all parties need to have that understanding of the other. Meaning that they need right. to know what, what you cannot tolerate or what you can't tolerate. So that's another, I'm very, very glad you also asked that question because this is distinctly a question for a democratic society. Right. So as Sheikh Hamza was talking about Bin Bayez saying the past is the past, well, there are many, many models of toleration. There are many, many models of coexistence. There are many, many models of people encountering others that are radically different from them, and lo and behold, managing to, 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 to see the sunrise the next day. The question, though, is when you have a democratic society, a group of people that is trying to govern itself collectively with no help from anything other than itself, no monarch, no pope, no cast of priests, how can we give ourselves a law or a series of laws that is ours and at the same time is just? So then you have to ask yourself, you know, who is included in this self-governing population? And so then you have to ask, I think, well, is difference about the good, difference about religion, difference about metaphysics, one of those things that is a marker of being on the inside rather than being on the outside? And if that is true, then I think you do need an account of why that kind of difference doesn't mean you're not a member of the self-governing people. And, but then if that's true, then I wanna know, I want, I wanna know, so a religious person might wanna know, well, how do I know that you're not gonna turn into a radical atheist that wants to extirpate religion, close down churches and mosques, and re-educate people such that they think religion is evil? Likewise, a secular person might want to know, I want to know how you view me. Do you view me as enslaving myself? Do you view, view me as somebody who is engaging in dhulm and nafs? Am I, am I harming my soul in, in holding these beliefs and thus a possible object of re-education or something worse? Right. So I think it's not the most important problem in politics, but, but that kind of mutual reassurance that I see you as my equal and I see you as somebody that is equally capable of deliberation in public, it's not also the, 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 the least important aspect of, of, of democracy. Thank you for that, it's an important aspect. Um, Sheikh Hamza, I want to ask you a question, but if, first I want to see if you had a quick, I want to add to what uh, just, Andrew was talking about. I think I would just qualify white people as Anglo-Saxons, um, because I think a lot of the other- We Irish did a lot of bad things in this country too, <laughs> so. Uh, unden undeniably, undeniably. <laughs> Um, policemen for the Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to pick up on, on, on uh, the document you were reading, but also on the Marrakesh Declaration itself, because it seems relevant to the subject at hand. Um, 
the Marrakesh Declaration is based on the Charter of Medina. And I want you to do two things. One is to briefly describe the, the, the historical Charter of Medina itself, what it was, but also why you and Sheikh bin Baya and others believe it's a relevant thing for us and particularly for Muslims to remind ourselves of today. Well, his, his argument, Bismillah, Sheikh Abdullah's argument is that uh, the, the, the modern concept of a nation state is, is a new concept for Muslims. Uh, prior to that, there wasn't this idea of a nation state or citizenship. If you look in all the traditional texts of political science, they talk about the al-hakum and mahkum the, the ruler and the ruled. The idea of what, what's called muwatana, uh, citizenship, was, was really not, it's a Greek concept. And there's an argument that maybe one of the first problems with the expansion of Islam is that they adopted a more Persian model than perhaps a Greek model in terms of government. Because the Prophet Sallallahu arguably, and th this is a big debatable point, but arguably there's not any specific way to rule in Islam. The, the, the Sharia is more constitutional than it is statute. And there's actually not that many statute laws in Islamic tradition. Um, there's constitutional principles. And so the Muslims have ruled in various ways throughout uh, human history. But the idea of citizenship was not really a concept, the idea of uh, a citizen being involved in legislation, in voting, and things like this. And so he's arguing that in the original model that the Prophet ﷺ provided when he first went to Medina was an enfranchisement of the different groups that were there. And this was a tribal uh, society the Jews had various tribes, and there were also Jewish Arabs who had converted to Judaism. Um, and then you had the, the polytheists, you had the, the Christians, you had some Christians, and you had uh, the Muslims. And so the Prophet created the Charter of Medina, which sometimes is called the Constitution of Medina. It's, it's debatable whether it's, it's, it's a constitution or not. But the Charter of Medina was basically that each of the groups were equal in their, in their uh, rights as inhabitants of Medina. And there's a very interesting verse in the Quran when the Prophet was chased out of Medina, it says, You know, you are a rightful citizen of Mecca, that they had no right to throw you out. And this is the birthright of citizenship. Hence, America is one of the few countries that actually has that. The idea of where you're born, you have a right uh, to, to be legitimately there. And we're in a huge debate right now in our country over this uh, issue. Uh, but so, so his idea was a restoration of the charter as, as an alternative to uh, the idea of paying tribute. So the poll tax, it's not really a poll tax because it wasn't everybody, only certain people had to pay it. And sometimes uh, there, there, were, there were many examples where the people did not have to pay. Monks didn't pay it, priests did not pay it, um, uh, nuns and things like that. So, he, he, most Muslims think this is the only way that we would relate to people outside of our faith in a majority Muslim land. And this is what ISIS did. They, they restored this idea of jizya. He's arguing that it's, it's not the only possibility and that the more appropriate one is to go back to the Charter of Medina. And he makes a very cogent argument that it was never abrogated, the Charter of Medina, and shows that historically that, that, that it's an acceptable approach to that. So that, that's, uh, that's what he did. But it's important to remember that the Ottomans abolished jizya also in the 19th century. And that was done with the Sheikh al-Islam and with the agreement of the scholars at the time. So this is not unprecedented. The, the Ottomans recognized also that uh, the, the world was changing and they needed to change with it. Maria, did you want her to say something? Because I have a question for you, but go ahead. I, I did want to say something quickly about that. I, I mean, it's, I think it's very interesting that he's um, um, recommending that people take a look at this. And I, that idea of citizenship is really interesting. I never really thought about it, that in the Constitution or whatever of, you want to call it, of Medina. Um, but one of the things I think is very important in that document to me, as I think about it, uh, is it presents a group of people coming together and agreeing upon a set of principles upon which they're going to live that is not higher than religion, but for practical purposes transcends it. Right. And so when people sometimes look at, let's say, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, 
one of the religious arguments some people present against is that it's setting a kind of moral standard that's really above religious moral standards. This is a standard by which all other, re all religions' moral standards right. are going yeah. to be judged. And so I think what this does is, is it says that you can have a common agreement that transcends religious difference, not because it transcends religion, right. but because it's something we all agree to, which I think is similar to, to what Andrew is saying as well. We all agree to live by that. Right. The second thing is that it also points to the kind of claim that your neighbor has on you. Right. Even though there were not just Jews and Muslims, but polytheists, as you say, living in Medina. But they were living in Medina. You had to live together. That claim that the neighbor has upon you is a foundation of, of virtue in Islam, and I think one of, I, we were talking about this earlier, I think one of the problems with, let's say, the way ISIS deals with, one of the problems, um, uh, deals with things is they're sort of taking these texts and just sort of using them as a blanket guide to action, completely missing the importance of, these are people, human, uh, human beings. Uh, these are, are, are people who are living in a place. They have a certain right to be right. there, have a certain right to live according to the way they want to live or their interpretation. And I think that is, ISIS is just that furthest example of, of how far uh, you can go when you lose that sense of the importance, the claim that your neighbor has on you. Well, I think also the point that, that virtue or, or something that transcends religion, that's clearly understood in, in, in the prophetics tradition that there's this idea a lot of Muslims and I and I think this is a major problem in the Muslim world is the conflation of ethics and religion the idea that you cannot be ethical without religion there's an argument that you can't ground metaphysically ethics without religion that, that, that's an argument but the idea that somebody cannot be ethical without religion is is completely insane but a lot of religious people have that misconception and and the Prophet clearly stated in a sound hadith whoever comes to you and you find pleasing his deen, his religion, and his character. So he clearly separated between religion and character. And he understood that the Arabs in Jahiliya had qualities that he wanted to maintain. And this is why uh, custom and norms are very important in Islamic tradition. Uh, wh wherever Islam went, it it acknowledged good customs and good norms of people that in its essence trans, transcend religion itself. That, that there's a, a human goodness that, that is innate that will manifest in societies that, that is not dictated by religion. No, I totally agree with you about the point about there's an assumption by most people that if you don't have religion, you don't really have a moral basis of any kind. I mean, that is part of human beings. But Andrew, did you want to jump in? I just want to say some very quick on the Medina Covenant is that um, it, you mentioned briefly that it includes polytheists. Uh, in a lot of sort of uh, the thought of some contemporary political Islam, as is well known for a lot of the 20th century, the idea of Medina was this kind of symbol of the fusion of religion and state, Deen Wadawla. Okay, so the year zero of the Hijri calendar begins with the Hijra to, to Medina. And what does that mean? It's the assumption of political and juridical and military and all kinds of other power. But in a lot of, so for example, the Tunisian thinker, uh, Rashid al Ghanoushi, in a lot of his writings about the, the uh, post Arab Spring situation in Tunisia, he has said the Medina Covenant is our arch model for politics precisely because of its inclusion of pluralism. And so he says at one point, we Muslims are lucky, we're fortunate that our political experience began in an experience of radical political pluralism. Right. And so all of, the, all of the stuff of politics, mutual security, covenants, contracts, ordinary day-to-day -day welfare, um, from the very, very beginning was presumed to be something that could be pursued across even the most radical religious differences. And so right. that's sort of become this, uh, you know, this kind of like, master metaphor for what politics is actually yeah. about in the contemporary period. Well, also, also the, the concept of dola, which is a mo modern Muslim word, it's been around since the Abbasids, but they meant revolution by right. it, a dola and mubarakah, but th that was the first use of it. But, but there's no word in Arabic for state, and state w w w w is, it, that was, they used like governance, and in fact the right. Umayyads called it had al-amr, yeah. based on the hadith. Like Cosa Nostra. The, exactly, <laughs> so, so it's, it's, uh, it's our affair. 
It's Hadha al Amr, this affair right. of right. government. Amir is the one who has the Amr, the command or the affair. But the idea of Dola, of a state, w w was not, they, they didn't conceptualize it in the same way that modern people do. And I think people don't realize how much poli political Islam has colored uh, the understanding of, uh, of, uh, of Islam, of modern Islam. They, they, it's very anachronistic to take a lot of these concepts and try to apply them to that early period. And there's, there's a very important distinction, and you're very well aware of this. In, 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 the, in, in most of the fundamental texts of creed, they deal with politics. And for instance, in the Johara, which was taught for 400 years at, in Al-Azhar, it says, wajibun nasbu imam al-adri, that it's, you have to have a just imam, a just ruler, or authority, uh, by sharia, not by rational, because there was a khilaf, there was a difference of opinion. Is government a rational or is it uh, injunction just for intelligent right. human beings? Should right. they do, or is it something the sharia is telling us to do? But then he follows it up. Mm. This is not a pillar of the religion. Mm. And, th and people forget this, that that the idea of, of a state is not a pillar of Islam. And, and it's very clear in the Hadith in Al-Bukhari where the Prophet tells um, Hudayfa when he doesn't see any clear uh, polity that he should just avoid all the sectarianism and, and just be a private Muslim. And that's, he didn't say, you, it, it's a farb kifaya on you, you have to establish the khilafah. He said, just be a private Muslim. And, and this is something a lot of Muslims don't understand this, you know, that, that uh, it's not a pillar of Islam, the state. The state, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to get to uh, this issue of, of uh, both, Maria, you and Andrew, both, both of you have um, looked at Quranic verses and based, uh, Maria, your article was based quite a bit on Quranic verses. And where you landed with the Quranic verses about Jews and Christians was you essentially were saying that there are some verses that are favorable to Jews and Christians and others that are not. And then you wrote this, and I want to read you your, uh, uh, a paragraph from your article and have a quick question about that. You said, suffice it to say that the ambiguity in Quranic statements about Jews and Christians is pervasive enough that the issue must be seen as ultimately irresolvable. And by a believer in the Quran and its divine origin, perhaps as deliberately so. After all, if God had wished to speak categorically against or in support of the soundness of these other religions, he surely could have done so. Has Muslim theology always understood the Quranic verses this way? And my second quite related question is, what lessons do you believe should Muslims take away from this conclusion that you're uh, looking at? Uh, well, I would say that, first of all, the, um, you know, when, when the Quran is talking about these religions, it's always talking about the people in those religions, not about the religions per se. Uh, it's talking about the prophets who founded those religions, and it's talking about the followers of the religion. So the question is, the first question is, what, what can you derive about the religion itself from what the Quran says about the contemporary, contemporary to the Prophet Muhammad's time? Uh, followers of the religion. I think that as um, Reza Shah Kazemi says in his, uh, in his book, or in an article actually, that if you were to look at all the things that the Quran says about Jews and Christians, and just to sort of put them in rough categories of, you know, positive or negative, there's certainly, there's certainly a lot more criticism probably than, uh, than, than endorsement in some way. But at the same time, uh, I think that there are places where the Quran just leaves this issue so open that you can't close the door on the possibility that there could still be guidance, uh, legitimate guidance or salvation from a theological point of view. And the question is, has this the way, is this the way that it's always been seen? Uh, I think that when you look at the Islamic tradition, even if you look at the verses that are very positive, for example, 262 or 569 that talks about um, you know the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians along with the believers whoever believes in God in the last day will have a blessed afterlife will have their reward with their Lord uh, when you look at what classical commentators say about those uh, they they don't read them as an open-ended assertion that Jews and Christians have an open path 
uh, to salvation. They tend to read those in a more limited fashion than the Quranic statements themselves. So they say, well, these mean the Jews and the Christians who followed the original Torah or the original gospel or who followed Jesus and didn't turn away or that kind of thing. Um, and it's certainly possible to read that that way, especially in light of all of the other chronic verses. If you read it holistically, I can see how they come to that conclusion. But at the same time, I think it's a powerful statement. It's not qualified in the context of the verse itself. And so I think that it does leave this very much open. Uh, but yes, the classical commentators had what I would call a clearly supersessionist view that although these religions or these scriptures had a, um, a guiding power in the past, they've been superseded by Islam. And as I say in the article too, you know, one of the arguments would be if you were a true follower of the, of, of the Torah and the gospel, you would see the, the truth and the message of the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran. And I think that's very clearly articulated. It has Quranic basis as well in sort of seven, verse 157, for example. So, um, but at the same time, I think that you, I think that there are places where the Quran just leaves it too open, even to say, not all of the Ahl Kitab are the same. Right? Some of them are very pious. They pray in the watches of the night. They hear the, the Quran itself, and mm -hmm. they, um, they're moved by it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I, and I think that when you take those open statements and you combine them with the human interaction of people who do follow those faiths, um, it's not like you can't see taqwa in the face of a, someone who follows a religion other than Islam. Um, it's not that you can't see those kinds of virtues that religion was designed to inculcate in other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you take what the Quran says and you take it in the context of um, relations with other individuals, you know, the matter cannot be completely resolved. And so coming back to this issue of the human, um, whatever you might find in classical texts, did not necessarily, necessarily reflect the situation on the ground. Muslims and Christians and Jews often lived together mm -hmm. uh, in peace, and even um, not, e not only in peace, but you know, in um, very profitable relationships intellectually, if you look at Andalusia or something like that. And so uh, a theoretical notion of supersession in which religion is really valid and who's really saved and um, what text really provides guidance? Well, these are questions ultimately I do, that, that are only resolved in the hereafter. I mean, we can't make statements about who's saved and who's not saved. Um, uh, but what we can all do, as I said, is, is recognize virtue. Mm -hmm. And although certain religions might, you know, emphasize certain virtues over others, virtues are virtues. Generosity, charity, mercy, justice, bravery, honesty. We know what those are. And, and to the extent that we those. see them cultivated in someone that follows a particular tradition. And that's your basic takeaway for Muslims, and is to look at that and say, that recognize those virtues in others. When you do recognize them, then treat them recognize well. Recognize them for what they are. For what right? they are, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Andrew, um, you looked at the Quranic verses about disbelievers, <clears throat> and you said that your where you land with that is that the God has caused the state of the state of affairs. He has sealed their hearts. He's hardened their hearts, you know, um, <clears throat> and uh, for of some people, but not others. And then you say this, um, and I'll read you a sentence from what you said. However, in the shadow of the view that God curses unbelievers, lie the views that their unbelief is not their fault and that God has de decreed it inten intentionally, possibly with some wise plan in in mind that is unknowable to mortals. If God has decreed it, what does it mean for those of us who are believers? I mean, you, in some ways you're suggesting that disbelief itself is not the fault of disbelievers because God has caused them to be so. But you also argue that reason and rationality can lead a person to believe, <coughs> um, you know, whether that there's no God. That, that the reason and rationality can also lead you to dis disbelief. And so my question is, how should the believer, those of us who are believers, view the disbeliever, given what you're saying there? Um, so there's a couple of things going on there. One is the question of how Muslims or others should see the doctrine that 
unbelievers should not be blamed because the state of their mind or the state of their heart is not their fault. So that's one question. And the, I think the point that I'm trying to make in the article is that uh, that's the dominant view. So when you read certain thinkers that are trying to come to terms with this, right, beyond Abrahamic fraternity, beyond Jews and Christians, how do you deal with this more radical pluralism? On my reading, the dominant view of how you explain disbelief is that it's, is that it's God's choice, mm -hmm. right? That if their hearts weren't sealed or if their minds weren't somehow obscured, then humans would naturally be led to what their fitra tells them, which is a kind of monotheism. I think that's more or less the view. Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, how do I think it should be? So I, I mean, I clearly think that if you look at the history of the encounter between Greek philosophy and revealed religion, mm -hmm. uh, when the philosophers start talking about religion as a philosophical problem, separate from specific doctrines like the resurrection of the body or, or things like that, what is a problem in religion for philosophers? So the primary one, I think the primary two really, are miracles and prophecy. So if the world is ordered in a certain way, and if the world is governed by certain laws, which the Aristotelian philosophers in particular wanted to believe was true, then how is it possible to believe in the suspension of those laws through miracles? The other is how do you understand prophecy? How do you understand that, that, that either there is a God that could actively intervene or that there's a human that could be disposed in a different kind of way? The only point I'd like to make now is that from the standpoint even of ancient and medieval philosophers, those were doubtable doctrines. Those were doubtable views. And that the normal exercise of reason could lead one to say that uh, miracles require some other kind of explanation. <clears throat> and that whether it's irrational to believe in miracles, and I think there are philosophers that disagreed on that, it's certainly not irrational not to believe in them. Whether it's irrational to think that there could be a psychological explanation for prophecy, which the Farabian and Avicenna explanation explain prophecy as some kind of hyperactive intellect that was sort of immediately connected to, uh, uh, to, to, to the divine intellect, it's also certainly not irrational to doubt that this is a source of knowledge. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, I think the most reasonable approach is to say that from outside of a kind of socialization into which revelation as a source of knowledge, never mind certain knowledge, specific examples of prophecy are treated as um, having veracity, that it, from outside of that socialization, there is an extremely high level of epistemic work to be done for somebody to take that as an exclusive source of knowledge. And so as an absolute minimum, I, just, I think it has to be acknowledged, particularly in the modern world where uh, we know what we know about source criticism, we know what we know about uh, how, how complex and how changing views about the cosmos and metaphysics are, that, uh, that, that somebody could regard the basic ideas of prophecy, revelation, and miracles as something that we don't really have any reason to accept, any rational reason to accept. Now, that can be said without ascribing irrationality or without ascribing false consciousness to those who do believe in them. Uh, not everybody manages to do both of those things at the same time. But I think at the very least, it is a honest attitude towards knowledge to say that somebody who doubts in miracles and prophecy is not deluded. Um, Sheikh Hamza, some years ago, I remember you wrote an article on Kufr and disbelief itself. I'm curious about this explanation about that somebody could reasonably doubt, if not disbelieve, um, you know, revelation and prophecy. Um, what's your understanding of that? How would you um, look at that? Yeah. I mean, one, one thing, the Quran in several verses, it's, it's very clear, like, is there any doubt about God? 
there, there's an assumption of, of belief that it's a fitra, it's, it's part of the uh, principial nature of the human mm -hmm. being, it's something uh, inclined. Even uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi argues that causation is natural to the human being, to, to believe in causation. And he gives an example, he said, take, and I did this with my kids when they were little. Um, he gives the example of taking a child who's like one year old uh, and, 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 and hiding and throwing something and then watching the child look for the source. The child doesn't just assume that it popped into existence. And so he says that it's a natural belief uh, to, to, to seek causes. In fact, the first philosophy of metaphysics is seeking first causes, looking at what are the first causes. And, and so th there's an argument that most of the Muslim theologians make that human beings, that, that if they think about it, they will arrive at this conclusion. I mean, this is obviously, there's also counter arguments about, um, you know, that, that the parts that, that causation in the parts doesn't assume that the whole has a cause. Um, and, and, and there's certainly um, the idea, Aristotle makes an argument that, and this is taken up by Amundsen and others, that, that the cosmos existed alongside God, so that the cosmos itself has, is eternal. And that was one of the things that Ghazali points out about the problems with the philosophers. But, it, but one of the things that fascinates me about, you know, I was taught in the creeds that I learned, a supersessionist view uh, of the tradition that uh, Islam in the Johara it says that the Sharia of the Prophet abrogated all previous Sharias. But it didn't deny the idea that there wasn't light and guidance in those traditions that was pointed out. Um, and, and that is the, the opinion of normative uh, Islam. The, the great scholars of Islam grappled profoundly with the problem of disbelief and the problem also of the fate of people outside of Islam. So you have people like Abu Hamad al-Ghazali who one of the last books that he wrote about four years before he died is called Faisal al-Tafriqa Bain al-Imani wa Zandaqa Bain al-Kufri wa Zandaqa the criterion that differentiates between disbelief and, and heresy and he makes a very strong argument that the vast majority, he categorizes people into four categories. Three of the uh, disbelievers, people outside of Islam, three out of those four categories he considers saved. <laughs> so only, only one he, he actually sends to the fire. The other three he considers them saved. And, and Abu Hamid is the embodiment of orthodoxy. And, 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 and Ibn Taymiyyah grappled with this. Ibn Taymiyyah, there's an argument that he's a universalist in his approach to salvation because he had a very problematic uh, with the, the eter eternity of the fire um, as an as eternal punishment for a temporal sin that, that a merciful God who's defined essentially with mercy. The, the Quran begins in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. So he makes an argument, and it's a sound book. I mean, some of his followers, modern followers, like Ali al-Harbi wrote a book arguing that it's, he didn't write it, but he did, because Ibn Qayyim al josiah quotes from it, his own student, Ibn al-Rushayyaq, his other student, quotes from it, and uh, Tajuddin al-Subki, who wrote a book called Al-Atibar, uh, Fi Baqa al-Jannati wa nar refuting Ibn Taymiyyah, because Ibn Taymiyyah argued that the fire will be extinguished, because he said it wasn't compatible with absolute mercy. And so wrath was not an essential uh, attribute of God. There's no, there's no, God is not al-mu'aqib as a name. He's not, the, the, the mu'adhib is not a name of God. It, the Quran clearly says that he punishes people, but it's not one of his divine names as, as a name. There, and there's a difference of opinion about whether the verbs are transferred into names, but that, that's another matter. And then you have somebody like Shah Wali Allah Kandahlawi, who also argues that people have too many filters. And this is one of Abu Hamid's arguments, that sociologically, people grow up, Abu Hamid says in the Munqid, he said, I noticed Jewish children become Jews, Christian children become Christians, right. and Muslim children become Muslims. And he said, because of the natural authority of the parent. Right. They just believe what their parents tell them. And, and so those are filters that make it very difficult for people. And then if you take somebody, for instance, like Abu Sufyan, who fought the Prophet for uh, 20 years, and then he finally becomes Muslim. 
Whereas somebody else who fought the prophet and dies in the first battle. Mm -hmm. That's very unfortunate. Right. Right. Right? right. What if Abu Sufyan died in that first battle? Did God know that he would have believed after 20 years? I, it, these are very difficult things that only God can really sort out. Right. And I think that is the message of the Quran is that I'm going to explain all this to you. You know, it's like the, 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 the director's cut. You know, you get the, <laughs> right. you know, the, you, you right. have these films that you can actually listen to the director explain why he did everything. And, oh, that's why he did that. <laughs> Right. And, and so <clears throat> one of the things about according to the, 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 the our belief about the end of time is that in the resurrection, people see everything they get to. And, and it's all it's all, you know, we're going to find out who really killed Kennedy. Right? <laughs> Quincy so, Jones knows, actually. <laughs> but he's... So but but there are many examples of this in our tradition where they really grappled with this problem of you know, understanding what's holding people back. Um, and, 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 and also, there was a deep compassion, I think, in, in, in our, our community for other people. We have, we have history. I mean, I'll give you an example. Ibn Omar, uh, Abdullah ibn Omar, when Omar was killed, a, a priest visited him to give ta'ziyah. Ibn Taymiyyah mentions that, you know, on the permissibility of doing ta'ziyah for uh, Christians and Jews and things. But a priest visited him and, and, and told him, Kun kathadith kama kunta fil awal. Be on the third like you were on the first. And he doesn't explain it and then he leaves. Ibn Omar says, write that down because that's a wisdom. That we, and here I am, you know, 1400 years later, because it was recorded, that wisdom. What he meant was, on the third day of, of ta'ziyah, of... Um, of, you know, when you, when you offer condolences. On the th be like you were on the first day. In other words, don't let this reminder of your mortality and death diminish as the days pass. You know, so be on the third day like you are today. And, and he, he wrote it as a wisdom. He was taking wisdom from somebody from another faith. Maimonides, Musha bin Mamun, he studied with Averroes. You know, they were, they were interlocutors. He went, went, went when, when the Muahidun took over, he, he had to flee Andalusia because of the Jewish persecution. Mm. Uh, he goes to, to Egypt and becomes the personal physician of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the Kurdish uh, ruler who, who uh, reconquers Egypt from the Fatimids. But there's an example of somebody who was honored mm -hmm. for his intellect, for his knowledge. of. Mm -hmm. So I think Muslims traditionally. You know, they did grapple with these issues, and it's very easy to, to, to dismiss it. Oh, they're all kuffar. I mean, one of the things that, that uh, Dr. Uh, De Cake said, I think is very important, that, you know, gentleness, kindness, all these virtues, if you look at the description of kuffar in the Quran, these are profoundly negative people. Right. They're arrogant, <laughs> they're puffed up, they're full of pride, they're, they're horrible to other people. And, and, and that's why, even though there's a legal designation of kufr for people outside of Islam, we have to be very careful. And that, that's what I was trying to argue in that, who Article, are the disbelievers. Yeah. Yeah. We have to be very careful about kufr. And th this is a khilaf, a difference of opinion between the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. Is it a temporary state or is it a permanent state? Right. You know, but Al-Qurtubi mentions that Omar was beloved to God when he was prostrating to idols in Mecca, because okay. Omar was Omar even when he was a polytheist. And so that, th there's nuances there that, that are really lost, unfortunately, on a lot of people with simplistic views of these problems. Um, Maria, I think I, I, I'm gonna ask you this question, because, but I think I kn know your answer, but I don't wanna presume that, but this idea of um, the disbelievers, the way that we're talking about looking at disbelievers, what you were saying earlier about Jews and Christians, and the way Muslims should, you know, uh, deal with them and engage with them. I assume that you think also think that applies to disbelievers as well. When you were talking about people with virtue, I mean, what Sheikh Hamza just said, because even the ones who have those virtues, that we should deal with them the same way, with compassion, with, you know. Well, many of the verses of the Quran that talk about dealing with people gently who don't agree with you in your religion 
come from Meccan verses and the interlocutors <coughs> that are implied are, are pagans. Right? So the <coughs> idea, you know, that God doesn't forbid you from doing, uh, fr from being kind and, and dealing justly with those who don't seek to oppress you in your religion, that's mm -hmm. with, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's in Medina, but it's, it's relating to Asma bint Abibak who rejected um, uh, a present from her mother, I believe it was. I'm trying to remember. The, so, um, so it, it's quite clear that these don't just apply to people who are part of the Atul Kitab, it applies in general. I mean, and uh, think also about even Moses when, and, and Aaron and Harun when they're told to go to Pharaoh, they're told to speak, you know, and they're told to speak gently, and that's to Pharaoh. <laughs> it was not just wrong, but I mean evil, right? <laughs> uh, and cruel. So, so um, what I'm saying is that I don't think it applies just to, to Jews and Christians. And I, I agree that it is possible, especially today, as Andrew was saying, for people to come to um, a conclusion of a certain kind of doubt, but it doesn't mean that they cannot also possess um, ethics and, and act according to ethics and possess even virtue. And I think the, a, a clear example of this is Abu Talib. The prophet's uncle, right? Um, I don't think Shiites will be very happy with this. Of course, Shiites believe that he became a Muslim, but from the Sunni point of view, he never became a Muslim. Would anyone say he didn't behave virtuously? Um, nobly? Uh, so uh, I think there are plenty of examples of that. And then you just, you know, you have to leave, you know, that's not a matter that, that human beings can judge, right? Um, Andrew, I want to get back to your, uh, I think you sort of explained this in, the, in your opening um, answer, but <clears throat> you use a term, um, you say you should go beyond mere toleration and actually have what you call reciprocal recognition of the other. Talk about that re definition of how, what does that look like when you say reciprocal recognition of the other? What exactly do you mean by that? Right, so again, the idea is that I think it's pretty obvious that toleration, while it sounds like a virtue, and in some cases it may be a virtue, it's something that people want to ascribe to themselves. Uh, toleration, you only tolerate what you don't like or what you disapprove of, right? So I tolerate too much salt in my food means that, you know, I, I, I probably shouldn't or it takes some effort or something like that. So I don't think any Muslim in the room today wants to be tolerated, right? What, what's, what's so intolerable about me that requires toleration in the first place? It wouldn't be bad, though. <laughs> so there are worse things than being tolerated, uh, but certainly I hope that we all have higher aspirations for the kinds of human relationships that we're capable of, right? Except um, not everything is worthy either of toleration or of some kind of reciprocal recognition. So, uh, you know, uh, you're mentioning technology and the evils that it comes with, and so we're all familiar with the kinds of, not just, you know, let's say Islamophobic or racist views that are going around, but views that are so radically in denial of science and rationality that we may say, what's the crisis of our democracy is that nobody can agree in our country on what counts as a fact or what counts as evidence. Right. And so the extreme persistence of climate change denial or things like this, this, you know, why are we even talking about religion when we have, you know, so many greater evils and ills in our democracy? So that should be your next issue. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so you might say, well, no, I, I don't, that, that's neither worthy, certainly it's not worthy of reciprocal recognition or any kind of positive recognition. It may, the people may be uh, sort of objects of toleration because like Abu Sufyan, you may hope that they have their, the, an awakening and they realize that they only were in denial of climate change because they listened to too much Fox News or other kinds of media. Uh, but even if that's true, here's the difference. If somebody were to say, you're designing a democracy from scratch, forget the constitution that we have, uh, you are designing an ideal constitution. Is it obvious to any of us that we would have the exact interpretation of the First Amendment that doesn't allow for some kind of positive cultivation of a public sphere in which genuine knowledge is disseminated and in persons who are capable of discriminating 
from true and false sources of information is regarded as an object of virtuous citizenship. So you might say, in a good democracy, most of the public sphere is something like NPR, okay? Not at that level of kind of, you know, bad taste, but sort of like most of the media is publicly funded. Uh, there's a range of ideological views, but there are standard, you know, Fox News would not be tolerated in a functioning democracy, okay? And it's only because you have something other than democratic norms that are governing. That's just a thought, just a sort of a thought to put out there. So there's many, many things that aren't worthy of your respect, okay? Deliberate lying, deliberate falsehood, deception, stoking up of, of fear and hatred of non-white people and all those kinds of things. All right, so then you have to ask yourself, well, how do I know the difference? What's the difference between climate change denial and like what Sheikh Hamza was saying, well, why is it kufr like that? The kufar are, they're, they're mustakbirin, right? They're arrogant, they deny what's obvious, they, they uh, invite towards uh, a vice and all mm. these sorts of things. So that's the traditional view, right? That infidelity, in that sense, kufr, is like Fox News, okay? It is active poisoning and destruction of the human brain and the human self. Now, I obviously don't think that. And as you know, there are many atheists that think that about religion. Right? Religion is active immaturity. Right. Okay? It is actively keeping people in a state of infancy. Right. Okay? Now, why is that not true? It's not obvious that any secular citizen or political philosopher has to adopt any kind of positive attitude towards religion, right. especially a religion mm -hmm. that's based on revelation, that's not like a natural religion, it's based on authority, it's based on texts that are one might say, no different in, difference in kind from the Odyssey or from Melville or something like that. So you have a genuine problem to say, what is it that's going on that says you are not enslaving yourself, you're not infantilizing yourself. In doing what you're doing, you are exercising something that I respect. Now, what is that? So, of course, in, in Kalem, the first obligation of all humans is nada, right? Seeking. To, well, to reflect or to perhaps to seek yeah. or, to, or, or the act of searching for these answers. So you might say that might be also a path to recognizing kufr, right? And here we are saying it, kufr, kufr, kufr in, in, this, in this audience. So that al already is a step towards, towards rethinking some things. You might say, you know, Stephen Hawking, he was searching, right? He was looking for things, he was using his mind, and that is something that can't be disrespected. So similarly... A, 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 a secular citizen or person or philosopher might say the religious person is being human in the most important ways. Trying to cultivate virtue. Trying to cultivate the things that uh, uh, allow for human life to be livable. Love, community, commitment, being outside of yourself, and reflecting on the ultimate matters of metaphysical concern. And I think the twist here, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll finish my answer with this, is that the way that a lot of, I think, liberal or secular political philosophers handle this is to say, we don't need to evaluate every religion or every doctrine or every life with this kind of like rationality meter. Okay, are you being rational? Are you being rational? Is Mormonism rational? Is Islam rational? I think that you, you take a broader sort of uh, step back and you say this kind of activity of living in communities, cultivating your conception of virtue, finding something that, is, um, uh, that, is, that makes life bigger than it would be otherwise, and answering questions that only human beings are able to answer, those kind of activities are what is valuable and worthy of recognition. And uh, in general, we don't see these activities as always leading toward the same answer. And so we say that the basic attitude is one of, you know, something different from toleration, but recognition and a kind of reciprocity. And then after that, you say, you reserve your, your obligation to say that certain answers to that um, violate human dignity or violate human reason 
or violate the norms that, that would allow people to live together. So it's not that any time you're engaging in metaphysical reflection or religious reflection or philosophical reflection that you are worthy of respect. It's that the general kind of activity, unlike differentiating on the basis of race or origin or intellect, is one that is, um, that is both indicative of human value and one that not everybody tends to, tends to agree on through the normal use of reason. I think while you, I was listening to you, I mean, I, the, the thought that came to me was, you know, unfortunately, the most vocal atheists we have, the new atheists as they're called, you know, the Sam Harris's and the Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens and folks like that, they have promoted this notion that religious people are not just tragic but dangerous. I mean, that's very far from the concept that you're talking about of, of recognizing people who are actually striving for virtue. Right? I mean, that makes it difficult, right. is what I'm saying. For right. The, the, the so, I'm not a new, new atheist. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. I don't do <laughs> and I, and I, don't, I don't subscribe to that, but then I should ask myself why, right? So, just the way that, you know, you might say, well, of course I believe in Islam, and of course I believe that it's true, so why do I prefer my way of gentle exhortation, right? Uh, why do I prefer that to something that's more aggressive in its da'wah or something like that? It's not that I, you know, you, somebody might say, well, this, this da'ya is actually preaching things that I think are true. They're being a little too harsh with non-Muslims. What's wrong with that? If it's not that what they're saying is false. So I haven't read all of these new atheists. I don't know exactly whether I, I agree with this or disagree with that. But there is an interesting question, which is, which is, when we think about how we approach others in the public sphere, what's the difference between what you think is a moral obligation and what you think is a question of good taste or prudence? So you may adopt this kind of strident anti-religious attitude. Um, and I might say, well, it seems to me a little bit overkill. It seems to me a little bit indiscriminate. You're going to, you know, uh, 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 lump together, you know, Franklin Graham on the one hand and, uh, you know, some good religious person on the other hand, right? And it just seems to me that you're, 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 you're mistaking what makes these things different. Right. Uh, and I think it, it also, it leads to a situation in which the only possible answer is apologetics, right? The only possible answer is a standpoint of defense and it only leads to a kind of sort of agonistic public sphere in which even your own principles of science or enlightenment or whatever they think that they're defending, they don't become actual things that you're invested in, they become symbols. Mm -hmm. It's like it's mm -hmm. often reflected about us, you know, we want Islamic banking, we want Islamic this, but you know, it becomes an identity marker that, more yeah. than, you've said this yourself a lot, more than it becomes an actual thing. So, so, my, so my attitude towards them would be, you know, uh, insofar as it's an active public dispute, whether climate change is the wrath of God or as a result of carbon emissions, by all means, defend the rational solution. But this idea that out of all of the things that are causing us harm in the world, you think you're doing something by treating rationality as an identity marker, as a badge that you wear, rather than as something to be actually uh, 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 pursued sincerely and, and right. humbly, right. it just has always struck me as, um, as uh, gives me the heebie-jeebies, well, right, and, to and, use the technical yeah. term. And, and, and I think part of that, you know, the identity element is, is, has become, I mean, it's always been, but it's become so overarching, you know, it just, all other considerations are set aside. So now people identify in groups, uh, I, I talk about Beni Islam, the idea of, you know, this tribe of Islam. Um, and, and one of the things, if, you know, taking a human being just as a human being. You know, the Moroccans have a beautiful saying, don't hold anybody in contempt because he might be a friend of God. No matter what their state, you know, they, they, you, you just don't know people. And, and the idea, this default setting that so many of us have which is to determine, we want to know what a person believes so that we can 
uh, put them in that box of checking it off. It's very quick and easy to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so kofar, kafir, is a, is a nice easy box. Um, and, and, and then, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the man about to jump off the bridge, you know. Oh, do you believe in God? Yes. Alhamdulillah. You know, right. oh, you know are, 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 are you Muslim? Yes. Alhamdulillah. Uh, are, are you Sunni? No, I'm Shia. Jump. You know, it's, it's that idea that, you know, we, 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 we tend yeah. to just look at those things that separate us and not look at those things that, um, that, that bring us together. And I'll just give you one example. I was with a group of um, Jewish rabbis. And uh, I got into a discussion. Most of them were Reformed, but there was an Orthodox one sitting next to me on the bus. And there was a Reformed one in front of me. And we talked about afterlife and about Rabbi Hilal saying that every Jew had to believe in an afterlife. And, and so the Reformed one was making an argument against it. When we got off the bus, the Orthodox rabbi said to me, I feel so much closer to you than I do to that um, <laughs> wow. Reformed rabbi. <laughs> you know, and... I think a lot of people, it's very interesting, if you set aside the boxes, you might find that you have much more in common with somebody that might not be in the same box that you're in that, that, uh, that, that, that you don't. And one other example of this, anecdotally, um, Sheikh Nabim Beya, who's the son of Sheikh Abdullah, he grew up in a place where it's 100% Muslim. And uh, they used to have these animus that came. And he said that always the shiuch would treat them really well and feed them. And they, they were from Mali. And that when, when it was drought and things, they would come over. And he said, we never looked at them like other than human beings and that we had a responsibility. But he, so he grew up with that attitude. He went to, uh, to uh, Egypt to study. He was, in, uh, he was in the university in Cairo. And he was in a building. And there was this guy named Am Jibril. I'm Gibril, they called him, Uncle Gabriel. And for two years, he, he used to help them, and he, he helped them navigate Cairo, and he, he'd, like, remind them of prayer. And this Sheikh told me he was an elderly man. He used to kiss him on his forehead. After two years, he found out that he was a Coptic Christian. He had thought the whole time that he was Muslim. And he told me, he said, I wondered how I would have thought of him had I known initially that he was a, a Christian and not a Muslim. And he said, it was such a lesson for me not to judge people based on, on other than their character, just based on the box that we tend to, to put people into. Um, before we close out, I want to <clears throat> get quickly to um, ask Sheikh Hamza one more question, and then I have a question for all three of you, and we'll wrap it up, inshallah. Um, Sheikh Hamza, you wrote a piece in Renovash about pluralism outside of this discussion we're talking about just in, the, in today's society. And part of your message or your um, view was that we think we're pluralistic, we have these outward signs of, you know, we have our identities, we have our skin color and all of that, but there's an in, inward sort of conformity that we have, that you call it as a monoculture of conformity. Um, can you talk about that a little bit in terms of like, how do, again, back to people of faith, how do we, you know, view, and some of us, people of faith, are also part of that culture and get lost in that sometimes. So this kind of a, this, this phenomena of, of, of believing we're very pluralistic when there's actually this monoculture that we're all sort of subscribing to, in a way. Well, well I think of all the things that troubles me most is uh, the, the inability for, uh, increasingly for people to um, just tolerate and actually listen to opinions that, uh, th that they don't agree with. And, and increasingly, people are, are falling into these silos mm -hmm. of you know, what they call echo chambers. And, and in fact, one of the, I think, terrifying aspects of the internet is that it will create your own echo chamber that's, that's for you. So it'll send you only things that you agree with and that you like <laughs> through this AI. And so I think, um, there, there's a type of, of conformity that goes on now. You have to be uh, fully on the program. If you're right, you have to take the whole right package. And if you're on the left, you have to t take the whole left package. And it doesn't leave for nuance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a Campbell, I think his name was. He was a Republican. He ran for Senate. He was a very complicated Republican because he was for gun control. He was, a, he was for legalization of marijuana. He had positions that didn't fit into that box. And, and people, it's very difficult for people to grapple 
with nuance. And, I, and, and so for me, that's a type of conformity. I mean, I, we had, I was just had uh, Dr. Eva Brand here um, from St. John's, and we were, t you know, artificial constructs came up. And she said, I, she said, I really hate that word, artificial constructs. He said, that's just the fact that most people are just sheep. <laughs> and and they, they go along with whatever, they, they don't really think about things, they just conform to whatever that dominant thing is and then it's defined as an artificial construct. It's just people conforming to whatever they grew up in, the environment that they grew up in. And, and I, th I think that's a problem. The unexamined life is, 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 uh, is, a, is, a, is a problem. And our religion, what, what fascinates me about the Quran is uh, arguably the Quran is, is a textbook against group think. Because every group in the Quran is misguided. The mm. only people that are guided in the Quran are individuals. There's no group right. that's ever guided in the Quran. They're all misguided. And they all have a group think. And they always go up against the individual and throw him in the fire, kill him. Right. You know? <laughs> and, and, and so it's quite tragic that the Muslims have fallen into a kind of group think where, where they lose a sense of that don't infantilize people. We're all moral agents. We have to ultimately make decisions. On Yom Qiyamah, you're, you're judged as an individual. The, 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 the judgment of nations is in this world, mm -hmm. according to our tradition. But the judgment in the afterlife is an individual judgment. You're not judged as a group. You're judged as an individual. And, and one of the things that I see that really troubles me is this collectivization. That's why I don't like using these terms that collectivize people. The, the Quran says, I don't want to be associated with white supremacy because I'm not a white supremacist. Just because I'm white or my skin is white, I, I, I don't want to be associated with that. And, and that's what collectivize, you know, that's what it does. It, 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 it turns a, a person into a group as opposed to a human being, an individual. And it's very important that we maintain individuality because we, I'm responsible for myself. Save your, so, your own selves. And those that you're responsible, like your children, to raise them properly as, as, with good character in these things. But you cannot save the world. And so this idea, and this has caused more human harm, this idea that we can go out and save the world. You know, that has killed more people than any other concept because all these ideologues that go out and have this collectivist view of reality, they go and they, and they say, we'll just need to get rid of these people. Pol Pot, everybody that has glasses because they can read, get rid of them because we need to start over. You know, we're always one more revolution from this utopia that never, that never comes about. And so I think it's really important for us as individuals to maintain that we are moral agents. Don't infantilize women. Don't infantilize uh, you know, anybody. Just hu humans, each one of us is responsible. And God's going to judge. Like, I, I, I can't judge people in terms of their backgrounds and where they came from. Khilaf in Arabic, difference of opinion. Ikhtilaf comes from a word, khalafa, what's left behind. Khalfi is your background. So the reasons we differ very often are because we have different backgrounds. That, that really do color our, our ways of understanding reality. So I, for me, that this idea of the group, I, I mean, Nietzsche, I think, was really right when he said that insanity is, is quite unusual in individuals, but it seems to be the norm in groups. <laughs> and I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, you haven't even mentioned the, you were talking about nations and m groups, but there's this new thing of identity, what's called identity politics, I mean, subgroups, you know, I'm, you belong to all these little subgroups, and that's even further sort of um, separating and infantilizing others in that sense. Um, I want to um, end by asking all of you to um, share your thoughts on a particular thing. I think um, I was going to read the whole thing, but Sheikh Hamza actually in his introduction um, talk read this, and I had picked out this quote, but I'll read the last part of it again and ask you all a question to um, end this one. This is a quote from Sheikh Limbaya. And the part that I, I just want to read um, uh, to you is just, uh, our world no longer identifies itself in religious terms. Instead, it identifies itself through culture, personal and social interests, technologies, covenants, contracts, and treaties. But this does not mean that people are not devout and religious. Make no mistake about it, a mistaken diagnosis is fatal. The 
the realities of our context today do not allow for the old categories of religion, as the world today is multicultural. And here comes the important part, I think, that uh, its contribution of pluralism, itself a virtue, provides immense opportunities for humanity to achieve a lasting and natural state of peace. So my question to all of you is uh, to leave us with this, um, th your thoughts on if you're living in a multicultural, pluralistic world, which is itself a virtue, and it has immense opportunities, then the question is, what advice do you have for people of faith, Muslims, but all other people of faith? Um, what can each of us do as a practical matter that would go beyond simple toleration and help us see the humanity of all people, regardless of, 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 of their beliefs? How can we, what steps can we take towards do that? What advice do you have for people? Andrew, if you want to go first, and we can go this way. Right, so I think that there's this conundrum, which is that because we're all moral agents, whatever other set of beliefs and commitments we have are going to be part of our understanding of ourselves. And because we are social and political agents, it is natural that we are going to want to act on our moral commitments uh, in the world, right? We don't have to want to save the world in a utopian sense, but hopefully we all want to uh, uh, improve it in some way. Mm -hmm. So you have, I think, this conundrum, which is we all have this sense of how we would want the world to look. We have a sense of what our teaching tells us how the world ought to look. And I think that there are a set of very, very hard choices, which is to say, let's say from a liberal secular perspective, I love it when the Catholic nuns wanted to boycott grapes with Cesar Chavez or when religious people want to donate money to charity or fight for universal health care. I don't like it when the same religious people want to prevent same-sex marriage or do other kinds of things in the realm of morality. But where does that distinction come from, right? So I, is it just my own secular prejudices that say, this is good religious action, this is bad religious action, or can I give some account of why there, uh, certain kinds of distinctions are reasonable. And so the only thing I would say is that without saying here's this obvious answer, here's this clear secular distinction between the public and the private or between what's good and bad, I would just say I think it's really, really important to say that just as Muslims living in a country like America want the rest of the country to chill out a little bit on Muslimy things, right? <laughs> to be very we careful do, do, yeah. about how you talk about the hijab, how you draw, you know, if you do this, then you must believe in this. So Muslims there are very, very clear that public power can be an atrocious thing. And yet, Muslims quite reasonably, and I think admirably, want to act in the world. They are commanded to, to, to uh, uh, command the right and forbid the wrong, and yet, being a responsible political actor also involves exercising your faculty of judgment. And so I have my answers, but I would just say I am fascinated by the, by the possibilities for this conversation to continue as to why making other people's lives better in some ways, but not other ways, is a legitimate kind of political activity and what's changed in the modern period what's changed today, and uh, how, from, an, from a religious perspective, you make those distinctions between helping other people's achievement of worldly and bodily and material welfare, but leaving aspects of their intimate welfare or their spiritual welfare for them to work out. It's not an obvious distinction. Muslims are not wrong when they don't make that same distinction. There's no fact in the world but it's a public conversation that is crucial and is something that I think is just developing in the, in the public sphere in America. And I uh, look forward to, to seeing how people argue about that. And you want people to participate in that conversation? Of course, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Maria, go ahead. Uh, well, I would just say one of the, the important things when we think about that particular quote that you just read and the importance of pluralism, the way that the pluralism is a benefit, um, is, is precisely, it, it benefits society in precisely the, uh, the, well, as the counterpart to the silos that you were talking about. 
Uh, societies are stronger, reasoning is stronger when you reason in the presence of other people and have to listen to their truth. There's a refinement of argumentation. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that people need to be prepared to do to take advantage of pluralism, especially for the idea of coming to an, a common understanding of what are our boundaries, where, to what extent are we allowed to put our ideas forward in society, even as recommendations for other people, and when do we need to pull back and say that's private? Those things in a society can only be worked out in conversation with the other person. They can never be developed in a silo. They can never be developed. And you know, when you look at societies that, historically speaking, have been strong, they've been strong precisely because they have been open to difference. I mean, one of the things that made the Muslim empire so strong in the classical period was that it, it had all of these people with so many different ethnicities, different ways of thinking about the religion. There was never one specific orthodox uh, theology, never one school of law. There was a recognition that difference made you stronger, that it helped to refine your thinking. It provided a critique, it provided a mirror, it provided a check on your own thinking. Uh, and I think that is something that made America very strong at a certain point, that it, that it embraced people from different perspectives. And so this, um, you know, what today we think of as a monoculture didn't always have to be like that. It could be something that was indeed a kind of culture that transcended your difference, but that was in fact developed precisely out of the interaction of people negotiating their differences. It was generated from that difference, but in a very positive and productive fashion, not in a negative fashion, not something that uh, forced people to sort of run away. And I think that the silos are created in part because our reality is created virtually. So sometimes, even though, um, I, I think Fox News would be happy to, understand themselves as kufar for the most part. <laughs> uh, they probably even have a license plate, yeah, yeah, or whatever the hat kind of thing. Um, but sometimes I, I, I do this, I sort of, you know, I read the news that I normally read, you know, in the New York Times or the Washington Post, and then I think, I, I see people around me who hold points of view, and I think, how can they possibly hold that point of view? And then I go and I read Fox News, and I say, oh, well, that's why they hold that point of view. Um, because the, what we read creates our reality. We don't interact with people the way that we used to, um, certainly the way people did even a few decades ago. And that's what's missing, that's what's lost, and I think that's what has to be recovered, and that's the hope that a pluralistic society has. Unfortunately, I mean, a pluralistic society can precisely force people into their silos. Okay. Uh, there's a fear of encountering the other. There's a fear of having your views reflected back to you in, in the eyes or in the words of someone who holds a very different point of view. That can be a very disturbing thing to hear. And so there is a kind of natural tendency among some people to flee to those echo chambers. But I think that's what we have to continuously resist. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I, I would, I think that one of the most important things to cultivate um, as, as individuals and, and societally is is uh, humility, mm -hmm. and, and I and I think that um, people, people, well, to quote um, a, a Nobel laureate, the. Um, uh, the rules of the, the game have been lodged. <laughs> the rules of the road have been lodged. It's only people's games that you have to dodge. That we, we have a sense of what is civil and what is right. And then there's people that don't play by those rules. And, and those people, they need to be seen for what they are as people that actually threaten civil discourse. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's something very dangerous for a society that wants to use persuasion as the means in which they do things. Now, obviously, there's a lot of, can there's many cans of worms that can be opened with this, because when you have societies that view things as unjust, then do we, do we rebel? Do, and, and certainly in, 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 uh, in Western civilization, uh, rebellion became a very important aspect. I mean, the Cromwellian, 
uh, disobedience to tyrants is obedience to God. In the Muslim version of that, it was to have a tyrant for 60 years uh, oppressing you is better than anarchy. And, and so very different perspectives that came up which is why so much of the Muslim world ended up becoming despotic, because there really was a very great fear of anarchy and what happens when rebellion. Mm -hmm. But in our, in our culture here, we have a system that's working relatively well. We have a lot of problems. Right. And, and we have to feel blessed to be in a civil society uh, in America, that, that we really have to cherish what we have and work to make it better but this we can see around the world where things break down how terrible it becomes and unfortunately sometimes our country has a role in where things have broken down and those are things that we have a responsibility of citizens in this country to fight against but I think just a humility is really important one, one of the things that fallibilism in religious understanding is extremely important to inculcate into young people that I can, I can be convinced of the truth of my religion, but I should be very, very wary of my certainty about my understanding of that religion. And, and when we arrogate to ourselves God's understanding, um, that's when all the problems come out of religion. And one of the most beautiful things about our, our tradition is that th the mufti uh, was in, in Sahir Bukhari, the prophet prohibited saying that this is God's judgment when you make a judgment. He, and Omar ibn al-Khattab, once his scribe wrote, this is what God has shown Omar. And he said, erase that and write, this is what Omar thinks. <laughs> right. Because they yeah. understood that they can't speak for God. Yeah. That all they can do is say, I think this is what God may have meant and this is my judgment in this situation, but I could be wrong. And so that fallibilism was very important. Imam Shafi'i said, I never debated anyone except I, I prayed that God would manifest the truth on his tongue so I could submit to it. And he also said that, that I always, when I got into a debate with my in interlocutor, I, I believe my position is right, but it could be wrong. And I believe his position is wrong, but it could be right. That humility of fallibilism, that, that I might learn something, right. is really important uh, to, to, to inculcate uh, in people. That, because certainty, we should have certainty, like I said, about our faith is very important. But certainty about our understanding is very dangerous. And the, the, the beauty of the tradition was every mufti always put at the end of his judgment, and God knows better. Allah yeah. You know, that yeah. I... I this is the best I can do, that's ishtihad, mm -hmm. but God knows better. And so I, I think that aspect of just restoring a basic humility to our religious traditions um, about who we are and, and what we know and is, is really important. And, and humility, according to the Quran, it is the virtue that will enable you to see the truth. And arrogance is, is the, the vice that will prevent you from seeing the truth. I mean, that's, that's, that's... And, hu and humility, that's, just to clarify, humility in your mind also doesn't... Mean, that humility means not to sit in judgment, to be too quick to judge others. Well, or does it not? I mean, we, judgment is, you know, we, we have to make judgment. Discrimination is right. judgment. So I'm not saying don't, don't make judgments, but make sure those judgments are based on, on sound reasoning. Right. Right. Um, opinions, you know, something the Greeks had the concept of sound opinion and doxa, as opposed to unsound opinion, that, that knowledge is one thing, and, opi and opinion is important, but your opinion should be reasonable. There's a lot of pe people that we have opinions. I mean, one of the things I read with the freshmen in the freshman seminar was an essay on BS, right, which, right. It, <laughs> which are, you know, he argues that there's so much of it in the world because everybody thinks they have to have an opinion about everything without thinking about it. And so it's, it's just important that we, 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 we know what we're talking about and we're willing. Imam Maddox said, half of knowledge is saying, I don't know. Just being able to say, I don't know. Being able to say, you know, I don't, I don't have an opinion on that because I haven't studied it. I don't know the issue. And, and I think people 
take very superficial and glib, you know, I, I, I'm coining a new word, you know, there's so many glibsters out there. Glibsters. You know, the, you know uh, glibness. You heard it here first, glibsters. Yeah. You know, glibness is a type of, it's, it's a fluidity that is shallow, superficial, and characterized by insincerity. And there's just too much glibness out there of just having opinions about things that you really haven't thought about. Um, I mean, you ask them, and it's amazing what they'll say. And then if you say, have you ever read the Quran? And that's why I'd recommend reading Gary Wills for people that, you know, he wrote a book called uh, What the Quran Means and Why It Matters. And he's a public intellectual. He won the Pulitzer Prize. He's very well regarded. Right. But he wrote that book because he was in a gathering once and they were all trashing Islam. And then somebody looked at him and said, well, Gary, you must have read the Quran. What do you think it means? And, and he felt ashamed that he'd never read the Quran. Right. And so he decided to study, and he actually used the study of Quran as the basis. And he spent, I think, a year studying the Quran, and the, the book is the result of it. And he was shocked at, at, at what, what he realized about the book itself. And so I think, again, that, that just is a testimony to his humility yeah. of saying, you know what? I've never read the Quran. I don't really know. I mean, I saw Thomas Sowell once. Somebody asked him about Islam, and he said, you know, I'm probably the only person in America that's not an expert on Islam. So I'm just <laughs> going to have to say, I don't know. Right? Yeah. I want to thank all of you for coming and all those online. Could you please join me in giving a round of applause for our speakers? <laughs>